uh, everybody welcome this afternoon to this latest installment of HU webinars uh, with paleontolog paleontologist Ryan Hupt. I'm Nathaniel Janik and I'll be your host for today's webinar titled Dissecting Jurassic Park's Dinosaurs. A uh, few logistics to cover before we begin. Uh, throughout the session, we're going to be using some of GoToWebinar's tools to help you interact with us and your fellow audience members. Uh, first and foremost, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. So if at any point during this presentation, there's something that particularly strikes you, you know, type it into the question box. You're going to find that in, uh, in the questions panel of your dashboard, which is probably on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and, and feel free to type in as many questions as you'd like. At the end of the presentation, we're just going to go through as many as we can. Uh, secondly, we'll be asking you some questions as well during the presentation through the use of polls, uh, which I'm going to do in just a moment uh, with the first one. Um, and then lastly, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you'll receive a link to it uh, a little bit after the webinar is over. Uh, you'll get one that's like an immediate, uh, this is the exact live version, but you should get another uh, link a few days later that'll be the sort of cleaned up. Uh, version as well. Uh, so with all that logistics out of the way, I'm going to start off with our first poll, uh, which is, uh, which of these Jurassic Park movies have you seen? Uh, Jurassic Park, Lost World, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World, or Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? Maybe there's some folks that uh, that are here today that that <laughs> like managed to get to some early screenings. I'm not sure. All right, and we're going to close the poll in uh, just a few seconds here in uh, three, two, one, and closing. And it looks like 100% uh, have seen Jurassic Park, which is good, I think, because uh, that's largely what you'll be talking about. 67% uh, saw the sequel, Lost World, uh, and it looks like it's about 53% for both Jurassic Park 3 and Jurassic World, but nobody has yet seen Fallen Kingdom. Maybe there's some folks that are going to see it tonight at midnight. Um, so yeah, so there, there we have it with our audience poll, our first one. Uh, with that done, I'm going to pass it over to you, Ryan. Take it away. All right, great. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I've been looking forward to this uh, since Nathaniel and Eric asked me to do it. So uh, we're going to be talking about dinosaurs today, a little bit of background on myself. This is me as a child uh, showing off my early fascination and obvious knowledge of dinosaurs at a theme park. But as I grew up and ended up going to college, I took a course about the natural history and evolution of dinosaurs that reminded me that like, oh, I actually still really like dinosaurs. I haven't actually outgrown this uh, in adulthood. And I ended up working in a paleontology in a paleontology lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, Dr. Paul Koch's lab. And he mostly does uh, the paleontology of mammals. So I ended up actually kind of switching gears from dinosaur paleontology to mammal paleontology. So now my primary focus is sloths and I work with both modern and fossil ground sloths. And I kind of try to use some geochemical techniques uh, called stable isotope analysis, if anyone's familiar with that to examine the diet of living sloths, which we can sort of observe, they're still tricky to observe, and then comparing that to stable isotope data from fossil sloths to see how good uh, the two connect and what new lessons we can learn by studying both of these animals, the living and the extinct versions, using the same technique. And so um, if you have nominal questions about that sort of stuff, in addition to Jurassic Park, it's not hard to get me talking, so just feel free to ask. Uh, even though 100% of people claim to have seen the original movie, I want to give a brief overview of what occurs. So it is uh, set in 1993 and a park being run by the guy, uh, the white haired gentleman in the background. Uh, Dr. Richard Hammond is getting, or John Hammond, getting ready, Richard Attenborough played, playing John Hammond. He's getting ready to open a park full of dinosaurs. The lawyer in the gray suit off to the left thinks that it's probably not going to be safe and wants to get some scientists in to consult on the park to see what they think. So the lawyer brings the dark haired gold bloom looking fellow, uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm and Hammond brings Dr. Grant and Dr. Statler to examine his Jurassic Park and uh, things 
seemed to be going well. There's all these cool dinosaurs running around. And uh, then the park gets hit by a big tropical storm. Everything goes nuts. The dinosaurs escape. And everyone has to kind of fight for survival. And not everyone makes it, but enough of them make it to then realize that this park is a terrible idea. And along the way, Dr. Grant learns that maybe kids aren't so terrible. So um, that's kind of the summary of the first movie, which is what in part inspired me to do this as a poster at AGU's fall meeting last year. Uh, my co-author Miles and I put together a session that was all about explaining fictional science fiction worlds using actual science. And the idea was that instead of just correcting things or saying this is what they got wrong, let's play along and see if by interacting within the world of these movies and TV shows and comic books and all those other things, can we still get across a legitimate science message, but not sound like we're just being naysayers? So I put together this poster. Uh, he did one on the carbon footprint of superheroes, which is a recent webinar that some of you may have also attended. And so kind of the meta premise behind my webinar today is I'm imagining that I'm a paleontologist living in the world where my colleagues, Dr. Statler and Dr. Sattler and Dr. Grant, have come back from Isla Sorna. They've come back from this island off the coast of Costa Rica, and they've been telling this really fantastical tale of seeing real dinosaurs created by this company, InGen. So for those of you who don't remember, InGen is the corporation that runs Jurassic Park and provides the technology for the cloning of dinosaurs. And so myself, as a paleontologist, would have questions about what they claimed to have seen because what they saw isn't entirely consistent with our understanding of paleontology. So I'm sort of imagining that this is like a conference that we're having at one of our, you know, the, the vertebrate paleontology conferences that we have. And I'm asking them directly of like, oh, well, you saw this, do you think that means that? And so that's sort of the meta premise that I'm going with here. So without further ado, I wanna dive into the first claim, which is this idea that they pulled DNA from mosquitoes trapped in fossil amber. So we have a photo here of one of the miners, the diggers for the amber, Juanito Rostagno, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Dominican Republic is actually known for its amber mines, so that's a real thing. And the problem that we run into is, as you see at the top of the screen, we have a few different time periods in play. So we have the Cenozoic, which is since the extinction of dinosaurs 66 million years ago up till right now. We are living in the Cenozoic. The Mesozoic is everything that of uh, the age of reptiles, the age of dinosaurs, as we call it. And it's divided up into three periods, the Cretaceous period, the Jurassic period, and the Triassic period. So Jurassic Park is obviously named after this middle period from the Mesozoic. Uh, they guess Mesozoic Park didn't sound like a good enough, good enough title. And then, um, so those are kind of the, the years, the time frames we're dealing with. A really big chunk of time. So almost 200 million years of earth history is when the dinosaurs were kind of around. Um, a little less than that if you consider the dinosaurs didn't really become super populous until the late Triassic. And below that is a geologic map of Hispaniola. So geologic maps can tell us a lot of information about the underlying structure of various regions. So the different colors on the map correspond to different rock units that have been identified. And then those rock units are usually associated with a specific age. And so the so not every piece of land that you're standing on is going to have the entire Earth history recorded underneath it. You might only have a small section of it. And what we see when we look at this map, it might be a little pixelated for some, but there's only two units here that are from the late Cretaceous. Everything else is outside of the Mesozoic. And so we're not capturing a lot of the Mesozoic with the potential amber deposits in Hispaniola, which is Hispaniola is the island that includes both Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So that's kind of interesting. So that suggests that um, the amber coming out of these Dominican mines, if they have mosquitoes and those mosquitoes have blood in them that can be extracted, uh, we're still only going to capture a little bit of the late Cretaceous. So some of the dinosaurs we're going to talk about are from the late Cretaceous and others aren't. And one thing we're going to do right now, if Nathaniel wants to bring that up, is um, Dr. Grant talked about seeing a group of dinosaurs moving in herds. And the name of the dinosaurs is never pronounced in the movie it's this um this one we're showing here and i've heard it said two different ways and i have a way of saying it and i'd be very curious to see if my way of saying it is in the majority the minority or if it's an even 50 50 split so 
Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, the poll is yeah. up there uh, at this point. Can you do your two different pronunciations? I'm not going to butcher it myself. Okay. Um, so the top one is para, uh, it's Parasaurolophus, and the bottom one is Parasaurolophus. So Parasaurolophus on top and Parasaurolophus on the bottom. All right. Well, the votes, the votes are coming in. Uh, and we're going to leave this open for just a few more seconds here. Well, here, I'll make, I'll make one more point while the poll's running. Oh, that way we can... Sure. Um, the, the large bodied long neck dinosaurs you see to the left of the dinosaur we're trying to describe right now, an interesting tidbit there is that they would not have actually been able to stand in water that was very deep because of how far their nose is from their uh, lungs. So it would have been difficult for them to inflate their lungs if their lungs were that far underwater and their head was above the surface. So this, these two dinosaurs are probably fine, but we used to depict these dinosaurs as being like in a swamp with their, most of their body fully submerged because we thought they would be too heavy to walk around on land. But in actuality, they would suffocate if they tried to do that. So that's kind of a cool Great. tidbit. Uh, yeah, so it looks like we got the, the results here and 61% uh, agree with you uh, and my wife. Uh, but 39% prefer the Parasaurolophus. So I guess, I guess it's right. I guess it is a, a contentious. A Parasaurolophus. Yeah. I tend to try to pronounce things based on like the actual Greco-Roman, you know, Greek and Latinate keywords that make them up, but I don't always get that right. And sometimes it is confusing because we spend most of our lives just reading these words and saying them out loud sometimes can be a little, um, a little bit of a gamble. So I'm going to say a lot of scientific names right now. Um, I want to take a look at the dinosaurs that Dr. Grant reported from his uh, trip to the island and talk about when they were from and where they were from. And I think we're going to see some interesting patterns. So the first dinosaur is the Dilophosaurus. And that is an early Jurassic dinosaur from North America. So that sort of works. We're kind of in the region of the Caribbean and we're in the right time frame. Uh, Brachiosaurus, the giant long neck dinosaur, is a late Jurassic dinosaur, also from North America. Then we've got the Parasaurolophus, which I can now feel comfortable calling it, which is late Cretaceous North America. Triceratops, one of the iconic late Cretaceous North American dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, uh, which I've heard mis I've heard Triceratops mispronounced as Triceratops, and I've heard Tyrannosaurus mispronounced as Triosaurus. So the the mispronunciations go much deeper than just the Parasaurolophus Parasaurolophus divide. Uh, but Tyrannosaurus is one of the quintessential dinosaurs that have ever existed. Uh, Gallimimus, which literally means chicken mimic, which is a late Cretaceous dinosaur from Mongolia. And then the case of the tricky Velociraptor. So Velociraptor first described as a late Cretaceous dinosaur from Mongolia uh, with the Roy Chapman Andrews expedition to Mongolia in the early 1900s. Um, and then since then, we've discovered many other raptor-like dinosaurs, including the Deinonychus, which is an early Cretaceous North American dinosaur, and much more recently, the Utah raptor, which is an early Cretaceous dinosaur from Utah. So these silhouettes are not to scale. The only three I tried to kind of get to scale are the three velociraptor type dinosaurs, the dromaeosaurids. And I do want to point out before we move on that I got these images, these silhouettes from a website called Philopic, which is linked to at the top of the screen. I don't think you can click that, even though it looks like a hyperlink. And that's a website that provides free silhouettes for scientists or just anyone to use. And anyone can upload silhouettes uh, for others to use on that site. And they've got all kinds of different um, types of organisms, including plants and, and microscopic things like bacteria. So if you are the kind of person who might ever need silhouettes for a project, that is a great place to go get them. And if you have silhouettes you want to contribute, you can do that there. So Velociraptor to scale with a human, presumably trying to corral or control them, is not actually a very big animal. Uh, it's got a very long tail, but other than that, its actual body is not that impressively large. If we scale that up to something like a Deinonychus, we're getting closer to the size of the animals that Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler described, but maybe the ones on the island still seem like they might have been even a bit bigger. And then some have pointed to the Utah raptor as a potential contender for what these dinosaurs were. And the really interesting thing about Utah raptor, I think it's a little too big, um, but we can, we can discuss matters of scale there. I guess it was going up against children. But... The Utah raptor, as an actual scientific uh, name and, 
and described species was published in the scientific literature the week after the first Jurassic Park movie came out, like one week exactly. So uh, I don't think that it would have been, I mean, there's no way the production crew or anybody like that knew about this dinosaur when that was happening because it was still being written up and described, but I just thought that was a funny coincidence um, how those two things have, have were linked in the past and remain linked today. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so when we put all these together, we see that there's a pretty big size discrepancy. Uh, all these reconstructions are covered in feathers and that's, that's probably accurate. These were pretty feathery animals by this point in their evolutionary history, but none of them really quite match the animal that was seen on Isla Sorna, which is actually relevant, I think, because if we were going to pull DNA from mosquitoes in amber and sequence it and grow that animal, the odds that we would always get animals we knew about is actually very low, I think. Um, the odds of us sequencing it and getting a completely new species that we've never seen before, I think are higher. So I think it's possible that if we actually had the technology to pull amber out of mosquitoes and sequence it and grow it into an actual organism, we would probably hatch some dinosaurs and other types of animals that were new to us and hadn't been found in the fossil record yet. And I think that would be an inevitable consequence of the development of this technology. And then one last thing is, uh, I know Dr. Grant, when he deals with annoying children, sometimes likes to compare dinosaurs to birds, especially a big turkey. And I think it's pretty interesting that in real life, uh, the turkey velociraptor comparison is actually pretty on point for size comparisons. So a turkey really isn't a bad thing to compare to a velociraptor. And if you've ever been um, chased or or threatened by a large male turkey, it's uh, I think you, you would still feel some fear. So <laughs> I don't think that's a, an inaccurate description to make. All right, so getting back to where each of these dinosaurs have been found in the fossil record, we have our North American group, and these do not represent the exact fossil sites that have produced these animals, but just kind of the general continental representation. Then we kind of have an Asiatic group. And as you can see, that's all of them are pretty far from Hispaniola. So the odds that a mosquito bites a triceratops that's living in what is now present day Wyoming, and then that mosquito manages to fly across the Caribbean Ocean to an island that might not even be there yet, land, die, get covered in the sap. Like the odds of that are just astronomical. Uh, possible, but I would say maybe not super probable, and maybe not probable enough to get an entire operational park up and running and off the ground. Um, for those curious, the me double checking where all these animals were from is uh, helped in part, in large part, to this tool called the Paleobiology Database. And so if uh, any folks out there are curious about fossils or want to learn more about extinct animals, this is a great place to go. You can search any taxa out there. It's um, run by scientists for scientists. And so everything gets put up here um, for other scientists to use. So if you've published a new description of a fossil, you would put some of the information of that that description here in the paleobiology database or as we call it the pdbd and everyone else can access it and it has like mapping tools and um all kinds of really just useful ways to look up quickly and display fossil data for any sort of project that you might be interested in doing so just wanted to put a plug in for that as we move forward and i think the ultimate implication of showing that these animals we're not living in the Caribbean as far as we know, and we're pretty far dispersed around two different continents, is that the parasites I don't think are the true source of the amber for the park's specimens. And I think if I can do a little foreshadowing here, we have an idea of where the DNA might actually be coming from. So the second claim that I wanna to touch on when it comes to the dinosaurs is that of size. And I think, so here's the Brachiosaur, we talked about that earlier. And then Nathaniel, do we end up doing a question for this one or? Okay, I guess not. We, we talked about doing a question for this one, but we have here a oh, Brachiosaur. Sorry, I, I was on mute there, sorry. Um, yeah, so oh, we, we, do have, we do have that poll set up. Um, if everybody can take a look at this picture, uh, want you to uh, say what's wrong with it. Uh, so you can select more than one. The options are the eucalyptus trees, the size of the dinosaur, uh, the grass, or Dr. Grant's fashion sense. Ouch. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, sorry, I, that, that was a late ad. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give everybody a few more moments to uh, respond. And I'm going to close the poll in three, two, and one. And it looks like uh, it looks like we've got 45% oh, say yes, yeah, size of the dinosaur. Another 30% say the grass, and 35 say the eucalyptus trees. Only one in five people say that there's a problem with Dr. Grant's fashion sense. So I think those people are on the right side of history. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, so one of the things that uh, I, I have used versions of this kind of presentation when I've taught dinosaur-based classes to um, talk about just various things going on in each of the scenes of Jurassic Park. It's a very rich movie, a lot of uh, detail to talk about. And um, grasses, uh, so if this dinosaur actually was from the late Jurassic, there would not have been grass. Grass would not have evolved yet, nor probably would eucalyptus trees have evolved. But in particularly, what's problematic about this particular uh, scene that Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler described is that the Brachiosaurus is consuming eucalyptus, which is not probably a good plant for it to be eating. It, if anything, it might even be toxic to the animal. So I would be very concerned about the park's ability to actually uh, provide appropriate husbandry for these animals since they don't seem to even be aware of what they should be eating. So, and then keeping them away from plants that could, that could do them bad. As a, as a person who works with sloths, which are very picky eaters, this is something I think about a lot. Let's see. Okay, so one of the other issues for the folks who said size is that these animals on the island appear to already be fully grown. And that's saying something if the technology that was developed in 1993 was supposed to be cutting edge for 1993 then the odds of them having full-grown animals it changes a little bit because we know that these animals didn't hatch fully formed their eggs were big but not that much bigger than the biggest eggs we see on the planet today which would be something like an ostrich egg an ostrich egg is as large as eggs get on earth dinosaur eggs bigger but not so much bigger compared to how much bigger a brachiosaurus is to a full-grown ostrich. And so what this study here did is they looked at the histology of the bones of these animals to determine based on a number of different bones if they could tell if the animal was still growing or not. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. And then they fit the um, estimated mass of the animal on the y-axis against the age of the animal on the x-axis and then where the white triangle is is when they assume the animal is about half grown so mass of 50 percent and then where the black triangles are that's where they assume the animal is about 90 percent so almost fully grown And the animal that most closely matched the early, the late 60s, early 70s, which suggests that InGen would have had to have the technology to clone dinosaurs 20 years before they actually let anybody come see the park, or they figured out a way to artificially age these animals, which again, probably isn't that healthy for them and suggests access to something else. So the implication here is that InGen has had this technology for much longer than they've claimed, or they're able to artificially age these animals. And I don't think either of those uh, are very comforting as for, for people running a, a theme park. Patient talks about how the DNA uh, sequence from the mos mosquitoes is full of holes. And that's true. Um, DNA is an organic molecule and it starts to break down when an, an organism dies and the bonds that hold the sequence of G's, A's, T's, and C's together start falling apart. And so you can kind of think of it if in words like Gattaca, um, that movie, but also a word spelled using just the letters from your DNA. Uh, so Gattaca, if you cut it in half and then jumble the, the two pieces up, you might not know that that word said Gattaca anymore. And every time you cut it in half, you're losing more of the information about how that
And the half-life of DNA is a couple thousand years. So you lose about half the information in a, in a couple thousand years. And then every couple thousand years after that, you lose half again. And so by the time you go through that process about 10 times, you've nine or 10 times, you've lost most of the usable information. And then we're talking thousands of years right now and dinosaurs go back millions of years. And so the odds that any of the DNA would be Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, Ryan, uh, you're you're cutting out a little bit. Uh, the past couple of slides. Be readable uh, in a way that can be sequenced and synthesized. Is sorry. I, I was just saying uh, your 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 audio was cutting out a little bit. I just wanted to to, to uh, let you know. Yeah, I saw the little meter on the. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. Um, it looks like it's good now. So. Um, okay. So so. Let's take the claim at face value that they are able to get some DNA that's somewhat readable from these dinosaurs. Even they admit that that DNA is full of holes and they have to plug those holes with something and they chose a frog. We're going to talk about why that's kind of a wild. Yeah, I think I think you're cutting out a little bit more. Um, I'm going to jump in here for a half second because I know that there there is a poll. claim. So this here. okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to jump in here with this poll and and hopefully it'll let the uh, uh, connection on your side catch up a little bit. So the poll is which of the following is the closest relative to the dinosaurs? Uh, is it frogs, crocodiles, uh, birds, or humans? Uh, and I'm going to give everybody a few seconds to vote here, a few more. Uh, and uh, we're going to close it in three, two, and one. And share it. And it looks like... Uh, Looks like 86% said birds and another 14% said crocodiles. Uh, hopefully the connection has come back now. So we're going to pass it back to you, Ryan. Um, and you can do a little bit more about that. Yeah, all uh, yeah, right. Awesome. OK, sorry about that, everybody. I will hope that the, uh, the Wi-Fi holds better here as we move ahead. And yes, most of you are well informed. So the closest living relative uh, to dinosaurs are birds. So close, in fact, that you might as well just say birds are dinosaurs. So when we create these phylogenies and these cladograms, we try to give, we try to create what are called monophyles, which is where one common ancestor and all their living or all their descendants make up a single group. And so in the case of dinosauria, you have the bird-hipped dinosaurs, like this Triceratops there. Um, you have the lizard-hipped dinosaurs, like the T-Rex. And then within Theropoda, which are the meat-eating two-legged dinosaurs, like T-Rex, within Theropoda, you also get the evolution of birds. And so for all intents and purposes, birds are theropods, they are dinosaurs. And the way we linguistically distinguish between the two groups in paleontology is we say that all of the dinosaurs you think of in a Jurassic Park context are non-avian dinosaurs and all birds are avian dinosaurs. And then outside the group of dinosauria, you have pterosaurs. So pterosauria is the sister group to dinosaurs. So uh, that's what people mean when they say that pterosaurs and pterodactyls and things like that are not dinosaurs. They're not, they're mesozoic flying reptiles. And then the one further node removed are archosaurs, which is a group of reptiles that contain crocodiles, alligators, and everything in that group, as well as the pterosaurs, dinosaurs, theropods, and birds. So uh, frogs didn't even didn't even make the cut. They're not even not even on this chart. That's how far away they are from being related to uh, dinosaurs. So a Crocodile or a bird would be a better choice for filling in the DNA gaps. Probably a bird could depend slightly on which type of dinosaur you're trying to sequence but or, or which trait you're hunting down. And then um, for those of you, since you all seem very well informed, I will point out that yes, I'm aware that there have been this shakeup in 
potentially the base of the dinosaur family tree where the bird hip, lizard hip distinction might not be the clearest way to differentiate between groups of dinosaurs anymore. And I'm aware of that. I think that's very interesting. I just didn't have time to modify this figure to adopt that. And it's still a little bit up in the air. But if you want to read more about this, this is based on a blog post a friend of mine wrote called Why Are Birds Dinosaurs? Um, just to kind of hammer home the point, I think sometimes when you look at a bird, if you come at it with the attitude of like, this is a dinosaur, you can see it. This, this is a, a shoebill bird from Africa. And I think it's got a very terrifying dinosaurian visage. And then you've got all our things like our raptors, which, you know, have these claws and they're very fast and intense. So again, I think you can kind of see that dinosaurian heritage, but sometimes they just look a little silly. And I think that's okay too. I think it's really fascinating that we talk about dinosaurs being extinct when really there are a group of animals as birds that live on all seven continents. They can fly, they can swim, they can burrow, and given a little bit of training, some of them can learn to speak English. So I think they're doing pretty well as a group, and uh, that's something we should celebrate and, and have fun with. Um, one thing, I just learned this recently, and so I just wanted to include it in this talk. This is a Sarima. I think I'm saying that right, but if um, anybody else knows how to actually pronounce it, it is a South American bird that is the last surviving member of the group of birds that include the terror birds, the giant birds that ran around South America after the extinction of the dinosaurs and ate the ancestors of horses. And you can see it here killing a snake uh, by bashing it against a rock. But also if you look at a close up of the feet, you can see that it actually has the lifted Velociraptor style claw. So that style of claw actually does still exist in nature, which I think is just so fascinating. So um, I just wanted to, to share that as we kind of geeked out over how cool modern birds are. Um, so yeah, to sum up the point I was making, I don't think it would have been possible to repair DNA at all because it would have been too degraded, but choosing frogs also suggests that they don't really know what they're talking about when it comes to repairing DNA. It's absolutely the wrong animal to choose. And so it just doesn't make sense that they're telling us the whole story there. And finally, there have been reports of a potentially new dinosaur that we don't have a verified name for yet, but it is talked about as being a synthesis between um, some sort of dinosaur DNA, but also the frogs that we've come to know and love, and then things like cuttlefish and uh, all sorts of other theories and weirdness surrounding this potentially new dinosaur. And I think that if this is true, it tells us sort of what is really going on with InGen and their Jurassic Park series. And it's that they're capable of doing more than just repairing and cloning very old DNA. I think that they're, if anything, they're able to just string together unrelated DNA and sequence it on the fly and get something out of it that's a workable animal, a biologically viable being. And that in and of itself is a totally different thing than ancient DNA and cloning. And it's actually a very powerful tool that has a lot of very potentially dark implications. So to conclude, um, InGen, the corporation who's claimed to develop this cloning technology, is not responsible for Jurassic Park in the way that they're claiming. If anything, that they're just making up these animals whole cloth and kind of putting them out there as dinosaurs and they're covering up some far more nefarious purpose. So um, with that, I wanna talk a little bit about the point of doing a webinar in this style where I'm pretending to be in the world of Jurassic Park. And part of it is because um, science has a representation problem. And this was exemplified recently by a Twitter hashtag that went around called bad stock photos of my job. And what it revealed about scientists is that scientists or doing science is mostly just about standing around a sterile room in a lab coat staring at something. In this case, staring at a chicken, which I thought was appropriate for our talk about dinosaurs. And so that's not how science is done. Obviously being a good observer is an important part of being a scientist, but science is done in all kinds of different ways besides just staring at things and then coming up with conclusions. And I think it's important that we represent ourselves as active and engaged people in the world around us and not just as these um, weird detached people who look at things to understand them better. And I think it's also important that if we play along with pop culture, instead of seeming like we're outside pop culture, we then become part of the pop culture and people don't see us as 
killjoys. And so, uh, for example, someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I'm a big fan of, and I think is a great advocate for science, can sometimes uh, get taken to task when he tweets things that other people think he's being curmudgeonly or not having any fun or not letting other people have fun. He's got to be kind of a downer. And so I just don't want scientists to become the old man yells at cloud Grandpa Simpson reference. I want us to be seen as these people who are excited about new movies and want to talk about maybe what the science gets wrong, but also what the science gets right and how we can all be excited about science because of these big pop culture events that come around at pretty regular intervals at this point. So I think, you know, pop culture is super permeated and is basically just culture and we can right, rail against that or we can play along and, and have a good time. And I, I try to do that. And so if you're interested in more of what I do, um, I have a website and I also have a podcast. My podcast is called Science Sort Of, and it's available on iTunes and at our website, sciencesortof.com. And it's a lot like this. We just have conversations uh, amongst ourselves and with other scientists about the work they do. And the idea is it's supposed to sound more like a um, conversation that scientists would have at a happy hour uh, or a departmental retreat and less like standing up at the lectern talking about a, a dry topic. And so uh, if you're into that, come check that out and feel free to give me feedback there. And I'm also on Twitter at Haupt. And so with that, I want to open up the rest of our time for questions from the attendees, because I think there's a lot to talk about here. And I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say. Right. Nathaniel, All how right. does that so we do have uh, we do have a few questions, but uh, for those of you with us, uh, feel free to ask more. I'm going to start off with the uh, the first one, um, and uh, I know this isn't necessarily your field, but uh, the first question was: Could the Dil Dilophosaurus that attacked Nedry have been a juvenile? Okay, so the question there uh, suggests that the person already knows that the Dilophosaurus reported by Grant, but I guess never, I guess if we're, if we're still playing along with the, the premise, um, Dr. Grant never saw the Dilophosaurus, but it, in the movie, uh, the Dilophosaurus is actually too small. It would have been a, a larger animal than what is depicted. So yes, it certainly could have been a juvenile. And then there's the, um, the whole thing about the frill and the spitting. And even though the frill is soft tissue, it would require some sort of structural uh, component to attach to the neck and to be like a stiff frill when extended. And so since that isn't something we find with the Lophosaurus fossils, it's probably not true <laughs> that that's just an invention for the film. And then the spitting acid, uh, acid poison saliva is also not something that's supported in the fossil record, but it would also be kind of a hard thing to find in the fossil record. So. Could certainly be a juvenile, but it's, you know, it's a pretty adept and precocious juvenile if it's already figuring out how to get inside vehicles and, and hunt things that are almost as big as itself. So that's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's really going for it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, uh, the next one that I, you kind of touched it with your, uh, uh, the, the item number four there, but uh, Scott pointed out that uh, we know that the Jurassic mosquitoes are reworked at this point, right? Um, there are amber deposits going back to the Jurassic and Triassic. So we do have amber deposits that old. Um, I, I guess when he's saying reworked, he means reworked in a geologic sense where they would have been subsumed back by the mantle and lost. But um, we do have some amber deposits that are that old. And I don't know if would they have any mosquitoes that are that old, but the, the amber alone is all you would need to, you know, at least have a deposit where you could find mosquitoes. So I don't think that that's necessarily um, completely off the table. Unlikely, but not completely off the table. Yeah. All right. So we have another one. And I, I kind of brought this up, I think, when you first asked the question to me during practice of uh, what's wrong with this picture. But um, Kendall wants to know, uh, how would they have gotten the plants at Jurassic Park? Yeah, because obviously- That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. That is a great question. I really like that question. Um, the plants, so it's only the female mosquitoes that actually drink blood, They're, that are hemophagous. Uh, male mosquitoes do actually suck the moisture from plants. And um, there are plenty of mosquitoes that are actually pollinators of various plant species around the world. 
So I guess if you pulled a male mosquito, you would get some plant DNA. I don't know if the the liquid being slurped from plants would have as much DNA as the blood from an animal, but I think that's the, the way that could have worked. But yes, Dr. Sattler did report that they also had fossil plants, and so that is a curiosity to be sure. Yeah, and um, and and also it kind of shows up on that ge geologic map, but uh, there don't appear to be any actual Jurassic rocks on Hispaniola. Correct. So that kind of also, I guess, uh, especially considering the fact that you um, po uh, pointed out that a lot of the uh, dinosaurs were from uh, not not the Jurassic uh, time period. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So, in ca uh, were actual paleontologists consulted for the films? That's the next question here. Yeah, I think um, if I remember correct, Robert Backer was the main guy that they they talked to to make the movies. And there's actually um, sort of a facsimile of him. He's mentioned in the, he's mentioned by name in the first movie. Tim mentions a book by him that he has, and um, I think there's a facsimile of him, a better represent. You know, Grant I think is sort of modeled af after him in the book. If you read the description of Dr. Grant in the book, and then there's a paleontologist in the second movie that does look a lot like him. So I think that was the main guy they consulted. But, you know, Michael Crichton, um, great author when it comes to writing a compelling thriller and an interesting parable about the, the dangers of un, uh, unrestrained science. But I don't know that he was the most research focused author, to put it as kindly as I can. Um, in the movie, like, I, there's a lot of weird little details of stuff they get wrong, and it's the kind of stuff you would only get wrong if you just didn't even bother. So, like, in the book, the island gets bombed by the Costa Rican Air Force, and Costa Rica hasn't had a military since 1952, 51, 52. They disbanded their military after um, World War II. So it's like, you're... I think he just played it fast and loose and just wrote whatever the hell he wanted to write. You know, there are names of dinosaurs that are misspelled in the film, so they didn't even check the spelling, let alone consult with an actual paleontologist about the biology, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you brought this up about uh, what they got right. Uh, I like that anecdote that you had uh, mentioned. Oh, I forget. Uh, what was it? It was it was the on the site at the beginning of the movie when... Uh, when they're locating the uh, the fossil. Oh yeah, so in the beginning of the movie, when they're brushing, when they're they're finding the easiest fossil in history, all it took was brushing a little sand off of a perfectly articulated and preserved Velociraptor, which again, from Mongolia. So that either that's a, a new and different species, or they got really lucky in Montana. <clears throat> um, the scene where Dr. Hammond is in their trailer, rummaging around, grabbing at a bottle of champagne to celebrate. Uh, him inviting them, them to the park. I was listening to a movie podcast and one of the guys doing the podcast mentioned that it looked like they had just tons of toilet paper in the park or in the trailer. And he was like, man, what's, you know, is becoming a paleontologist make you incontinent or something that you're just constantly needing to go to the bathroom? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I got really excited because when you're in the field as a paleontologist, one of the ways that we wrap up our fossils to keep them uh, cushioned and dry for transport back to the lab or to the museum is toilet paper. So that's actually a detail of set dressing that I don't know how they got that right, but it's totally valid that paleontologists go through a lot of toilet paper, but it is not for us. It is for the fossils because it's cheap. Uh, it's, you can buy it anywhere in the world and has a little bit of moisture wicking. So it keeps them a little bit dry, but is also kind of soft and, and a little bit cushioning and can be wrapped around literally any shape. So sometimes, you know, fossils don't always come out in very convenient shapes. So toilet paper is a great way to keep things safe and dry for transport. Um, great. All right. So an, uh, a scientific uh, question here. Uh, was ambient carbon dioxide concentration high in the Mesozoic? like high enough to affect global temperatures and allow the dinosaurs to flourish? Uh, I think the main, so the main theory for what caused the dinosaurs to diversify as rapidly uh, and intensely as they did in the late Triassic was that there was another extinction that happened. So the Permo-Triassic extinction was the extinction that preceded 
the rise of the dinosaurs and that extinction, we're still kind of debating what caused it. It was probably caused by absurdly long and intense period of volcanism, uh, which would put a lot of carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere. And that extinction, the Permo-Triassic extinction, killed about 95% of all life on Earth. It's the worst mass extinction in Earth's history. So it's a bigger extinction than the late Cretaceous extinction that killed the dinosaurs. And so we, th we think that one of the reasons the dinosaurs became such a diverse and populous group is that they happened to evolve this really useful body plan by the time this extinction had happened. So they had this kind of... Um, sort of Dilophosaurus looking, but a Coelophysis is, is a good example of this if you know your dinosaurs really well. So kind of a two-legged, reasonably quick, uh, carnivorous animal that was just well adapted for the world that was left to them when all other life kind of died out. So suddenly you had this body plan that was pretty good all purpose, but was highly adaptable and could evolve into all these myriad different forms and the world was empty. So they, they just diversified and filled all the ecological roles that were left available to them after everything else had died. And um, that seems to be, and then granted, you know, temperature plays a role in that <clears throat> carbon dioxide concentrations and global temperature influence primary productivity of plants. And so the more productive plants are, the more energy you have at the base of the food chain. If you think of just food as energy, the more plants there are and the more production of plants that there are, the more things that herbivores have to eat, the more things herbivores have to eat, the more things carnivores have to eat. So you're just kind of boosting the whole food chain from the bottom, which gives you a lot of energy to try out different body plans and evolve to these enormous sizes. So I think those are some of the factors at play there for the, the rise and diversity of dinosaurs. Great. Um, so another one here, uh, and uh, you, you might, you may not have heard of it, which will make it complicated to discuss, but apparently in Russia, there's a thing called the, the Pleistocene Park. Oh, uh, I am familiar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they they, they want to know uh, how you feel about it. <laughs> so, so, I, I've already got it marked on my map to go visit. <laughs> I'm going to show people. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited about Pleistocene. Um, here's where it is. So that's Pleistocene Park. And Pleistocene Park, uh, operates on this idea of rewilding. So essentially the world used to have, um, megafauna, which is basically any, anything above a hundred kilograms sort of counts as megafauna. So that would include most people, um, so large animals, large enough to influence the environment in particular ways, ecosystem engineers is sometimes also what they're referred to as. And since the early 90s, there's been a small but vocal group of people who have argued that um, we should reintroduce African animals into like the Great Plains and Texas to bring back the megafauna that went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, at the end of the last ice age. So that's things like um, elephants to replace the woolly mammoths, cheetahs to replace the extinct American cheetah, lions to replace the extinct American lion. And it's an interesting idea. They also kind of argue it from a conservation perspective of like these animals will be safe or if they're in Texas, which I don't know that I agree with wholly. Um, but the problem is to do it in that way where you're taking an animal that is from Africa and has evolved to live in Africa and then just moving them to Texas and say, hey, we did it, doesn't really work to quote unquote recreate an actual extinct ecosystem because the animals you're bringing over aren't perfect analogs and the climate is different than it was at the end of the last ice age. We're not 100% sure that it's human's fault that these animals went extinct it could have been a combination of human hunting and climate change. And so there's a lot of factors in play of why would you want to do this? Like, are we making up for an extinction that we might have caused? If so, we need to make sure we actually caused it. But also we need to make sure that we're putting it, the environment back together in a real way. And one way I heard these um, 
ecosystems that would exist in Texas described was they would be Frankenstein ecosystems because we're just stitching together dead parts of a thing and hoping it works the way it's supposed to when it comes back to life. And I think that's an accurate description of that. Um, the one in Russia is a little bit different from what I understand. And the way it works in the Russian one is they're not, uh, they're sort of bringing large herbivores up into the tundra. So things like, um, bison and elk and horses and, and things that will graze out in the tundra. And they're basically giving them room to roam free from any threat of hunting uh, by humans or, or being run off the land by a rancher or anything like that. And the reason they're doing that is because we found that when grazing animals, so animals that eat grass are out there eating on the tundra, it actually helps keep the tundra colder because when they pull, when they're pulling up grass, they're kind of disrupting the root structure of the grass. And they're also kind of like just adding some air to the system and moving the soil around a little bit. And we found that that actually helps keep the tundra cooler. So if you're worried about tundra warming and uh, permafrost melting, so permafrost is never supposed to melt because it's supposed to be permanent. This is one way that some have argued we might be able to preserve permafrost into the future. Um, I think that that's fundamentally different than cloning a mammoth. Um, so as far as I know, this park isn't advocating for anything like that, but there are obviously people who are talking about cloning mammoths and whether that's possible. I have different and more mixed feelings about that. I think uh, for me personally, this is just speaking for myself. I think as long as animals like elephants are endangered, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to start bringing back mammoths. I think if we can get the elephants on good a good footing, solid hold of, of health um, in their environment and, and no hunting pressure, then maybe we can start talking about mammoths. But until then, I think we got to deal with what's on fire right now and, and save, <laughs> save those kind of far out sci-fi notions for maybe a less, a, a moment of less crisis, but that's just me, so. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Speak this this reminded me. I had completely forgotten until you brought that mammoth thing up. But uh, the whatever weird foundation is that's trying to fund the uh, the mammoth cloning thing. Uh, I, I I met the guy that owns it because he was trying to find smaller species that would be easier to start with to test it out. Um, and there's a species called the heath hen, uh, which is native to Martha's Vineyard, and so it, it it's like the environment still exists of where it uh, where it, where it grew up. So he actually interacted with the museum that I was working at to uh, get some samples of of Heath Head. Yeah, it was it was interesting. It's curious. Yeah. So I did a yeah I did a podcast Generation Anthropocene, which was a podcast that Miles Trayer, the guy who was my co-author on the um on the poster. Uh, this was the podcast that he hosted for a while. <clears throat> and my episode that I uh, guested on his podcast was about this whole topic of rewilding. So if you want to learn more about that and what I think, you can go find that. I can't, I don't have the link uh, readily available, but that's that's out there. Yeah, and that's with Generation Anthropocene? Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, this kind of touches on it a little bit, uh, this final question that I have here, but uh, they ask, uh, what are some ways that other ways that you think scientists can engage with pop culture representation slash discussions of science other ways i mean i think other ways would be uh you know so i've i'm now given this as a poster at a scientific conference i've given this as a talk at a science fiction convention so a science fiction convention in baltimore that actually has a fair amount of science programming so i think um as a comic book fan, the convention scene is a really welcoming environment for this kind of content and people will actually show up. So I think going to conventions like that, as opposed to j just talking about it at our own scientific conventions, which tend to be just preaching to the choir, actually going to, to places where there are science interested people who will sit through a lecture like this has been a great experience for me. Doing these webinars is great. Um, I know Twitter is a real mixed bag of nonsense, but there's actually a very, active and in my experience positive science communicator community SciCom as it's often called a uh, community on Twitter so I've, I've had really good and positive interactions there and then 
Um, for me personally, you know, I've been doing the podcast for almost 10 years now. The podcast is great. It's certainly speaking to a specific kind of audience. It's the kind of audience who want a, who even know what a podcast is and then want a science podcast. So that's not the biggest group. And it's also, it's a very broad reaching thing, like a podcast or a thing like a webinar. Anyone in the world who has an internet connection can show up to a webinar or get a podcast. And so I've tried to been thinking about other ways that I as a scientist can contribute to my actual community. And so I've been trying to <clears throat> do things that are also not just on the internet, but have a more community focused uh, angle. So I've, I've started judging. Anytime somebody asks me to judge a science fair, I say yes, if I can, my schedule permits. And that's been really great. And obviously that's not doing it in a sci-fi way, but it, it's, it is the opportunity to go talk to young people and give them a positive encounter with a scientist that they might not get otherwise. And I think volunteering, you know, schools I found are often looking for STEM educated people to help supplement uh, what teachers are able to, to teach just in terms of having another expert in the room or specific subject matter or coming and talking for a career day about careers in STEM um, are all things that I found teachers to be very excited about and very engaged with. And so I think just letting your people in your community know that you're available as a scientist or as a STEM person to show up. Um, it's that sort of, you know, it's like the, when they talk about voting, like democracy is decided by who shows up. And I think science outreach and science communication is also largely driven by who shows up. And so showing up and being excited and not just being a naysayer. And I think, um, I didn't really talk about this in my talk, but from a big picture perspective, there's a lot of bad news that scientists have to give the world. Um, we're the ones telling everyone that climate change is real and that vaccines work and that evolution is real. And so it's things that people don't always want to hear. And so if we're also, if we're coming at some things that are really fundamental to people and what they believe, then it doesn't seem like a good strategy to also attack the things they just like, such as movies and comic books and television shows. And so I think if we can also say we like those things and say it legitimately in a way that is believable because we're also having fun with it, I think then it makes it a little bit of an easier pill to swallow when we have bad news. If we're always giving bad news, I think it's easier to ignore us than if we have fun and then give the bad news or it doesn't even have to be in that order but just like if there's a little bit of both and not just oh don't talk to that scientist they're just a they're they're a downer and they never want to have fun everything's grim and grim and awful and terrible and getting worse and so let's go do something else instead if you can yeah just that's i don't know that's a rambling philosophical point about the importance of liking sure. the things you like and then also yeah trying to talk about the things that are really important yeah, and uh, just some some uh, shameless self promotion from AGU. I don't think that it's been fully released yet, but I know this week uh, we finally made the the hard push uh, and grand announcement of uh, the centennial celebration. Uh, AGU celebrating its hundred years, and I I know that it's in the works and it isn't official yet. But there's a a small pool of money put together for like. Not not grants per se, but um, we can't call them grants because that means something different in the science world. But small amounts of money to help you fund uh, like small local outreach programs to help uh, share your science with the public. And I think that they're going to be well, there's some that are five hundred dollars and under. And then if it's a larger program and involves a lot of other collaborators and it, it, you have you have a good case uh, there, there could be some funds to help fund. Uh, events up to 10,000 from what I heard. I think that that announcement is coming out in a few weeks. Uh, they're still working on ironing out all the details, but for those of you who are interested in doing that outreach, uh, you should keep an eye at centennial.agu.org. Um, and I also, I was able to get a little bit of money for an outreach project through the Paleontological Society, which I know is specific to paleontology, but that was a little bit of education outreach money that I'm using to work with a uh, summer camp in Appalachia, and I'm going to put together some fossil finding kits for the kids. So there are little bits of money out there if, if money is the issue for not getting your outreach done if you just go hunting for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and there are, there are plenty of societies. Uh, if, it, if it fits within your science, chances are there's a society. And 
I don't want to say all societies, but a lot of societies uh, like to be able to put their funds towards things that make us, you know, make our science look good and expose exposure to the public that it otherwise wouldn't get. Uh, so I have one final question here uh, before we close out, and that is, what is your favorite scene or moment from the Jurassic Park movie? Um, I mean, it's just a toss up between everything Ian Malcolm says and does. I just, I am <laughs> such a huge fan of Jeff Goldblum and his portrayal of that character in particular. Uh, favorite moment is, I, I think it's when, when like the, the storm starts and we get the first T-Rex encounter. That whole scene is just amazing. Like when things start go, when the things finally start going wrong in the park and uh ian malcolm just says oh boy do i hate being right all the time and um <laughs> my impression is even worse than usual because i'm fighting a cold right now but i appreciate everyone suffering through my my weird sounding voice for the webinar um but yeah when he says like oh boy do i hate being right all the time and then just everything from the what where's where'd the goat go to the kids screaming and the eye the and the eye pupil contracting in the light and the cup of water with the the ripple effect, which they actually got um, by attaching a guitar string underneath the cup. So it's somebody stroking a guitar string to get that perfect concentric ripple coming out because they weren't able to get that effect any other way. And then just the roar, the roar of the T-Rex is such a well-designed sound. Um, you know, it's, it's a combination of gator, tiger, because alligators are actually the world's loudest reptile. If people didn't know that, American alligators. If you want to look up alligator, American alligator noises, the the noise that the males make for mating is like this deep rumble that actually causes the water next to them to shimmer and like jump around. It's really cool. So well. <laughs> American alligator, tiger, lion, and then baby elephant trumpet is where that kind of high pitched note from the T-Rex comes in. So I just, uh, that whole sequence is, is fantastic. Oh, well, great. That's a great, great, great response. You just describing that actually is getting me excited. And I almost feel like I want to rewatch the first one before this weekend so that I can, Fully enjoy uh, the, the the new movie now that it's coming out. Uh, but yeah, so I want to thank everybody for coming, and I especially yes, want to thank, thank you, you Ryan. Uh, this was a great presentation. It was my uh, absolute yeah, my absolute pleasure, and I appreciate all the questions from people. And I I could have kept going with this, so let's. If you want to continue the conversation on Twitter or um, contact me through my website, you are encouraged to do so. <laughs> great. All right. Well, everyone, thank you again for coming and uh, have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.